Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Comedian MTG. My name is Ian. Today, I'm going to be breaking down the top four from Mox Masters December 22. Now, for any of you who are not aware what Mox Masters is, it is a collaboration tournament. So it's hosted by Playing With Power, the largest channel in all of CEDH, and it's run by Eminence Events, which is the premier CEDH tournament team. So the fact that these two powerhouses have collaborated into one major online tournament series is just fantastic. These events have been super well run, and I'm here to talk to you about it today. Now, as many of you know, probably from clicking on this video, I found out I had uh, COVID an hour before the tournament started. No one's going to, this is an online tournament. Obviously, I wasn't putting anyone at risk, but uh, yeah, that was definitely a bit of a roller coaster. I had felt completely fine the day beforehand, a little bit of a dry, like, tickle in my throat, but I woke up that day just feeling awful, coughing up a ton, and I said, you know what? I committed to playing this tournament. I really want to compete today, and I ended up all the way in the finals of this tournament. So feeling super gracious to be able to put up a result despite the fact that uh, I still am currently sick by the time I'm recording this video. And uh, you may notice a bit of a different lighting here. I am currently in my new residence. Uh, my, this is the first video in this residence, so it may come out a little bit differently than my last video. And so any sort of comments on the lighting or anything like that you see in this video, feel free to leave them down in the comments below. But yeah, super grateful to have put up another top result here. Um, this feels like a really solid year for me as far as a as a player. Um, I've put up multiple top 16s now, two top four performances, and obviously winning the last Mox Masters. So feeling really good about this. And without any further ado, let's jump into the decks for today. But before we do that specifically, I want to remind you that if you like videos like this, please hit like and subscribe because it is so, so helpful for the channel. And if you want to support content like this, if you want to help me participate in all these tournaments to give you the tips and tricks for CEDH, please make sure to go over to patreon.com slash comedian mtg any support you can give really helps out a ton without any further ado let's check out these deck lists all right so i figured i would at least start with my own list for this one so this is the version of winota that i took to mox masters too it's really really funny because this is a single card different than my primer list at the current moment for those who don't know i literally moved all of last week so i didn't really have a lot of time to be experimenting with new stuff the only change that i made to this deck list compared to the actual primer of the deck right now on the CEDH deck list database is that I added a copy of Clown Car because I was aware that a lot of people were really interested in this as an option for Noda. I was a little skeptical, but I figured, you know, what's the harm in trying out another Ornithopter Memnite type piece to see if it actually had a little bit of payoff. I literally did not see it at all during the tournament, and it only came up once that I wished it was a signal pest, so it's not looking great for a clown car. Uh, to be clear, signal pest is the card that I cut for it. But the fact that signal pest is an evasive flyer, it can be played for a single colorless mana and it buffs your whole team, actually provides a lot of value. And there was a time when I had a ranger captain fetch and I was like, man, a signal pest would be so good right here because it generates bodies and puts pressure on my opponent's life totals. So so I very much unfortunately miss Signal Pest and Clown Car does not seem long for this deck list. But apart from that, this is literally my exact primer. Now, things that I have noticed now that I've played this tournament is that I want a little bit more removal on the list. I'm thinking that there's a couple cards that I'm gonna be floating around and I will be updating the primer with those as they get tested. And I believe they're actually in the sideboard of my Winota primer currently. But just, I wanted a few more removal pieces that would allow me to be able to hit Hit some really problematic permanents, specifically things like Dranith Magistrate. That card was definitely a pain. There were several games, especially there were games that I won without ever casting Winota, which was awesome and definitely uh, feels good to be in that position. But also there were games that had Winota come down a single time during those games, despite all the removal I actually do play in this deck, which is not a small amount that had Dranith gone away earlier, I would have been able to easily completely dominate a certain game. That happened at least two or three times. So definitely realized that a couple removal pieces in the deck more would be pretty helpful and there's a couple really good pieces that I'm excited about uh, testing in the list. Specifically I'm really interested in looking at we can actually look them up here. Soul Partition which as I mentioned this Brother Ward just came out by the time this video is releasing so uh, this is Exile's an online permanent and for as long as that card remains exiled its owner may play it. A spell cast by an opponent's way it costs two more to cast so this is a really unique tempo piece you can flicker your own pieces with it if you need to save them or get ETBs back like you can hit your own Winota. Um, 
Um, but also it allows you to, if you have something like a Draenith or a Brule of Law, just like lock your opponents out of being able to play the pieces you exile with this card. The only problem is, is that two CMC is a little dangerous because we play Sanctum Prelate, and that card will often be naming two or three as the relevant converted mana cost. So it's something to know, especially when looking at two CMC spells in this deck, is that two is a very potent number to hit, and I often name that number if I don't name three because of Toxic Deluge. The other card I'm really interested in is Touch the Spirit Realm. This one's really interesting because the channel ability, and I was just talking about this when the Winota server and a couple of people mentioned, I believe Maratium, who's one running one of the other primers, mentioned this piece. I'm very interested in this card because the channel ability, one, allows you to get around your tax effects, it can't be countered, and it will allow you to remove pieces for a turn. So for example, I really like having my opponent's Draineth Magistrates on the battlefield as long as it's not hurting my deck, and it only hurts my deck in the ability to cast Winota. So I really like the idea that I can use the channel ability to flicker someone's Draineth Magistrate on the end step beforehand, go to my turn, play my Winota, attack, get a bunch of triggers, and then at the end of my turn, Draineth will come back in and be able to lock out my opponents continually from their end. Uh, I love when my opponents play other stacks pieces, just not Draineth specifically. So Touch the Spirit Realm is actually looking like it's really, really likely to end up in the deck, and also it has the option to just be hard cast on the enchantment side and be a functional piece of removal that way. So uh, big shout out to Maratium, uh, one of the other Winota Primer authors, as I said, who is not only a supporter of this channel, but also just a, a great Winota pilot, and the suggestion is super hot, and I can't wait to test it out in the list. But yeah, for those who are curious about this deck, the entire point is to play Winota, and then with a bunch of early drop non-human creatures, so a bunch of early stuff that we get out, and a bunch of like small stacks pieces, the idea is to get a bunch of Winota triggers, and just drop humans onto the battlefield, and basically through a ridiculous ability to break parity on stacks pieces, specifically rule of law effects, Winota is able to really capitalize on that and just steal games by just throwing a ton of advantage onto the battlefield. And also, as I mentioned, I played multiple games this weekend where I did win without playing Winota because a lot of the time you can just play this sort of like stacks beatdown plan, right? Like there are other stacks decks that exist without Winota in play and the ability to just like play your Archon of Myria and your Aven Mind Sensor and beat your opponents down in the air and then have big top end threats like Thalia's Lancers, which the more I play this card, the amount of games this card specifically has won me in games where I do not have Winota is insane. Uh, I cannot stress enough because many people over time historically have talked about cutting Thalia's Lancers, and I cannot stress enough how much I disagree with that decision. It has almost single-handedly won me every single non-Winota game I have. Uh, this card is insane. The ability to just go Thalia's Lancers, get Kiki Jiki, and then just be like repeatedly activating Kiki, targeting the Lancers, putting eight damage with first strike pressure onto the battlefield, and tutoring up cards like freaking Rick and Rionia and like all of these insane value engines. That card's just crazy. Big lessons I learned from this tournament. We need a little bit more removal and Clown Car is probably not making the cut, unfortunately. And the fact that it gets hit by our own tax effects is like definitely a real cost of this card. It definitely seemed like it was a cool option. Uh, I love that it's like a late game mana sink, but Unfortunately, Clown Car does not seem to be making the cut, and uh, it's going to beep its way out of this deck. <laughs> now, we do have our obligatory blue farm deck of this top four. <laughs> I just noticed the description of this deck. That's that's pretty funny. Thanks, Forcon, for that. <laughs> the laugh there. This is Tim Necron Blue Farm. For those who don't know, this is a pretty classic turbo ad nauseum list. Um, the entire point of Tim Necrom, specifically in the Blue Farm shell, is to be like the mid-range deck of the turbo ad nauseum strategies, right? We've talked multiple times in the past few videos about Blue Farm appearances and how specifically the blue farm decks that are being played as a mid-range deck are always going to have greater advantage. They're going to play really well into the format right now. And that's like the correct way that a lot of these like very competent blue farm pilots are playing these decks. They're playing them like mid-range decks that also happen to have the explosivity of the color red and just potent threats like Vassa's Oracle, Demonic Consultation, Underworld Breach, all of those things. Gone on record already saying white is probably the best support color right now. So Ranger Captain of Aeos, Grand Abolisher, and this list is even going as far as playing three mana to fairy, just as these very hard to interact with silence effects that come down and they basically stop your opponents from interacting. At Oktoberfest, I was just telling someone about this earlier that I had a game where I was facing three separate Ristic studies from my opponents, but the fact that I played a turn two Ranger Captain meant that I was just able to upkeep 
crack the captain and go off and despite how many cards my opponents were drawing none of them drew the right pieces at the right times and i was able to win the game through basically an untouchable board state with given what was happening during that game so that's definitely like one of the major appeals of blue farm right now this one's definitely like light on the artifacts which is pretty interesting seeing as there's still like a mox opal deck you have things like esper sentinel ragavan give you treasure stuff like that it's definitely uh, lower on the artifacts than like some of the other blue farm lists i've looked at the classic enchantments here all like some of the best stuff in the format dress down is such a huge tempo piece against a lot of the stacks decks which i think there were a decent amount of uh, at this tournament specifically like this is probably the most standard blue farm list i've seen in a really long time there's nothing really too out of left field spicy in it uh the the, the teferi is probably like the most like spicy card here that's a quite often played and a lot of it is just like some of the best interaction in the format some of the best win conditions in the format things like breach as i mentioned thassa's oracle uh and just like a lot of very high card quality cards and win conditions that are really meant to just be able to capitalize on the fact that you're doing a lot of insane stuff now the high card quality isn't exactly the same as like something like a dawn maker deck where like every card in your deck is like trying to be of a higher card quality but of the fact faster slant this is definitely like the mid-range deck that has the higher card quality of these fast decks right so blue farm is the card quality variant of these low card quality lists right but yeah obviously very strong list nothing too much to really say about it so we have accepted here alex on another performance by this kenrith laird evolution the executive list many of you have seen this list in top fours before because this is one of the playmax uh top four contenders uh alex has been competing competing in so many tournaments throughout the year and consistently putting up results with this deck. It is very, very solid. It plays a lot of really good stuff and it plays Kenrith and uses Kenrith in a really, really solid way. Kenrith got locked out of our finals match, which is kind of why it didn't do too much. The finals match was definitely tough because we were sort of always under the pressure of Thrasios that had a Seaborn Muse, which we'll talk about in the Dargo Thrasios deck. But, you know, this deck is very strong. Kenrith is an amazing mid to late game engine and a little bit better than uh, Timnath Rassios in that sense and it allows you to like just do tons of crazy stuff it's really really good especially against the stack stacks in the format and as I said this this as much as blue farm is like the mid-range fast deck this deck might even be more so so let's talk about all the loops that are available into it so you can do things like oh also there's straight up <laughs> how could I forget there's a deck tech of this deck on this very channel and which I will leave in the link right up here I don't know how many cards different it was than when we posted that video but uh this is the deck that we were talking about when Alex came on this very channel. I can't believe I almost forgot about that. But let's talk about it. Yeah. So we have a bunch of like classic mana dork packages, only like the most efficient ones I'm noticing. So like Death Rite, Birds, Ignoble, Noble, like all the ones that provide multiple colors. Esper Sentinels here because it's one of the best cards in the format. Hot take, maybe not even. Um, Ranger Captain, talk about how amazing that card is. Version definitely plays like very few creatures, but the ones it does play are very strong. I watched uh, Kinnon be very, very exceptional in our finals match just being able to provide like a ton of extra mana and just like being a huge tempo piece and you know had Kenrith ever been able to hit the battle in that finals match had it ever hit the field Kinnon would have been absolutely insane but Alex had like seven or eight mana just like without much to do about it um which was rather unfortunate he did spin Kinnon a couple times during that match it was pretty funny if you notice Skirk Prospector maybe seems like it stands out a little bit here but for those who don't know there is actually a loop with Dockside where you play Dockside and if you make five treasures what you can do is you can actually sack your Dockside to Skirk Prospector's ability for one red. So you have five treasures in the battlefield and you have one red floating in your mana pool. Then you use four of the five of those treasures and the one red Skirk mana, and then you use Kenrith's ability to put target creature from a graveyard onto the battlefield under its owner's control. So you reanimate your own Dockside, you have netted one treasure. If you do that, you create an entire loop in which you are able to generate infinite mana with Dockside and win the game. There's also a Phantasmal Image, which for those who don't know, also goes infinite with Kenrith, but you need to have, I believe, eight treasures because uh, you need to be able to reanimate the Phantasmal Image. You need to be able to target it with Kenrith's ability to put a 1-1 one -one counter on something. But if there's eight treasures in the battlefield, Phantasmal Image, if it can copy a Dockside, goes boom, Fimage, enter, make eight treasures. You target it for two mana. You reanimate it for five. That leaves you with one treasure floating, goes infinite. And once again, all these infinite mana loops allow you to uh, draw your whole deck with Kenrith or make your Kenrith infinitely large and kill people with it or draw your whole deck, play all your creatures, do all of 
that stuff. Kenrith does like, or, or you just make your opponents draw your deck, their decks respectively, because um, you can just continually put those triggers in the stack and make them keep drawing. Apart from that, uh, you know, just like some of the best five color options in the format, or like just a bunch of broken stuff. Uh, obviously, this is playing Thoracal as its main win condition. Um, apart from these dockside loops, uh, playing really solid board wipes right now, which I think you need to be doing into the current format. Like you need to be able to wipe the board. It's uh, this format gets very gummed up really fast. So calling ritual and deluge really providing you a lot of value here. You see Savines here because this is a classic deck that plays the intuition piles with Underworld Breach. Underworld Breach being one of the main win cons of the list. Playing ad nauseum, very much defer a five color deck that plays a lot of lean interaction. The average CMC of this deck is 1.21, which is very solid for an ad nauseum list. And because you get like all these lean mana dorks and all five colors of the best interaction in the format and kind of just have this super low mana base that is able to basically play a bunch of really efficient spells and efficient interaction and go off. And once again, you know, if you ever just like flood out with this list, you have your kind of in the command zone to just immediately pay you off for all of that, which is super cool. And yeah, the deck's just playing a lot of really solid cards, uh, some solid interaction, Grim Tutor, all that stuff. And it's just a really solid deck. So congrats to Alex for another top result for this deck. Once again, if you want to see a really in-depth version of this deck tech where Alex and I gush about how cool Kenrith is and all of those things, you can check it out in this card right up here. Thank you so much. Now, our tournament winning deck list. We have Manelmage with Dargo Thrasios, but not Dogwater. This is a super spicy list. So throughout the tournament, and this is going to be a jumping off point uh, for a conversation that I'm going to have. There's going to be two separate conversations here before we really dive through this deck list. One, this is a Thrasios list. It is playing Seedborn Muse as a main advantage engine for anyone curious to go watch that finals match. Seedborn Muse stole the game. It absolutely created an arch enemy situation and we just finally ran out of answers by the time this deck was able to pop off. But this was a super cool deck to watch. Um, but Thrasios Seedborn Muse decks right now are seemingly in a very, very solid position. They, I mean, I took Dawn Waker to the top four last weekend. There was Ball from Split Second was in this top 16 also playing Don Wicker Thrasios. There was a Jessica Thrasios list also in this top 16. And here we see Dargo Thrasios also in the top 16. All of them being Thrasios value Seedborn Muse piles, which I, I, I'll say it once and I'll say it again. Like I think the strategy is still exceptionally strong and pretty slept on for being probably one of the best things you can be doing in this format right now. And uh, speaking of Thrasios Seedborn Muse things, one of the things that I have worked a lot on as a Thrasio Seedborn pilot, as Dawn Waker is my favorite deck, right? We've talked about this before, is the ability to play Thrasios at a very quick pace. Um, because there are a lot of micro decisions that are extremely important, especially when you have a Seaborn Muse, you're getting like three activations a turn. You got to scry, you got to check your hand, you got to be able to know top or bottom, is this going to advance my game plan? You got to be able to put all these pieces together. And I've gotten very good at, you know, not going to time with this deck. One of the major problems with Mox Masters 2 was the fact that there were several rounds that went about 40 minutes over time which is the longest I've seen in any tournament, even longer ones. I've never seen as many rounds as I saw in that tournament go over time. There were multiple judges present during multiple rounds where I was very frustrated by the lack of slow play warnings given to by players. It got to the point where at one point I had asked a judge to give a player a slow play warning. There were certain players who every single round were in the rounds that were going to time and 40 minutes over, you know, multiple rounds in a row, like these, these same players, handful of people, every single round were always in these rounds that were going 40 minutes over. And it's, it, it becomes a point where you're like, there's no surprise that this keeps happening. And had they received the appropriate amount of slow play warnings, this wouldn't have been an issue and the tournament wouldn't have finished at two in the morning, but it did. <laughs> and to be clear, I am not saying uh, our finalist was one of those players. I think uh, Manila actually played at a very quick pace given the Thrasios. I just wanted to talk about this because I know Thrasios and Seaborn were one of the strategies that some of those players were using, um, which is kind of why I use this as a jumping off point right now, because I didn't want to go through this video without talking about this issue because I think the tournament was extremely well run but there were just a lack of judge calls specifically about the slow play warnings and even in matches I was in I had to like physically push these uh with judges present in the room it wasn't like I was like I'm gonna call a judge on this now it was I had judges in the room and I expected them to make these calls but they weren't doing that which was quite frustrating because everyone was like like everyone's time was impacted by this I didn't get to have lunch during one of our rounds because of a player's slow play so 
that was definitely a thing. So that being said, if you're a tournament organizer, if you are a judge at these events, if you are a player in these events, and there are players who are taking a long time, please do not hesitate to hold them accountable for their actions, right? Uh, not calling slow play in these tournaments is is going to be tough, and it's going to affect all of the players present. It's going to make the tournament slower. It's going to drag the rounds out. It's going to create situations where players are frustrated at what, at the end of the day, was an extremely well-run event. So the fact that this extremely well-run event has this little asterisk next to it being like, oh, but it took way too long, that sucks. <laughs> it sucks that this well-run event well-organized tournament has this one cloud hanging over it because of the fact that people were not calling slow play. Just just a note, this is something to think about going into these tournaments. And I'm not talking about, you know, people taking a second to think about their plays on like the pivotal turn, right? That stuff is not how we do things. But I'm talking about if, for example, you're playing a Thrasios deck and you're scrying and then you look at your hand and then you put it back and then you look at it again and you put it back and then you ask about a piece on the board and then you look at your hand again, and then you put it to the bottom and reveal, and then you have two more Thrasios activations, that is an unacceptable pace. <laughs> uh, once again, this is just an example of, of certain slow play patterns. So if you're a player in these events, look out for patterns like that just because it affects the entire event. And it creates situations where rounds will go to a draw more often, and those events and those effects change the way the rounds happen. So it's just something to note, think about that as you go forward, and without any further ado, let's actually talk about this super spicy deck because I want to stop talking about slow play. So this is a Dargo Thrasios list. It's it's pretty hot. I'm not going to lie. This is a pretty cool list. So one of the main reasons to play Dargo in the teamer colors is the fact that if you use cards like Eldritch Evolution or Neoform, you can go get a Tidespout Tyrant out of your deck, which is so freaking cool, right? Like it's, oh man, the ability to just like play your commander, usually for like one mana, cause it's Dargo, and then go Neoform into Tidespout Tyrant, play Zero Rock, make infinite mana, win the game is so cool. There's also like just a ton of spice in this deck and I'm so excited to talk about it. Uh, super big shout out to Manila for taking, not only winning a tournament with this list, but winning a tournament with a super spicy list. Narset, super cool to see against other like value mid-range opponents. Love to see that against, you know, especially a number of like turbo decks and stuff like that that are using a bunch of wheels. So let's talk about how you win with this deck, right? So we talked about infinite mana with Eyes About Tyrant and then you're able to pump that in three Rassios, draw your whole deck, etc, etc. There's also, I believe, Underworld Breach. Yep, there's Underworld Breach packages in this list. The ability for you to be able to do the classic Breach combo, playing uh, Brain Freeze and LED. Let's find that Brain Freeze. There we go. And then there's some like spicy Dargo combos. So with Phyrexian Altar and Dargo, if you have the appropriate amount of sacrifices to get Dargo onto the battlefield for one red, you can then sacrifice Dargo to the Phyrexian Altar, which then counts as the commander cost reduction, and it gives you the red mana you need to recast Dargo out of the command zone. So Phyrexian Altar and Dargo means you cast Dargo infinitely from your command zone, and it generates infinite storm, and then you can win through a number of different ways, but I believe the most common one is through Grape Shot, uh, being able to storm and just kill your opponents that way. As I mentioned, there is the Nars set and uh, windfall in the deck definitely interested to see why i guess probably for the no no wheel is very interesting to me i think i would always play wheel over windfall specifically but i'm definitely very interested to hear why that choice is made uh, natural order is super cool just another way to get seedborn muse onto the battlefield i've actually talked to a lot of people about doing that in dawn maker thrasios as well um you know what's the ev of being able to just natural order into a seedborn muse and that choice was definitely made here another card that's super synergistic with dargo is greater goods you get to sacrifice it draw seven cards and then discard three which you know you do that a couple times then single uh, suddenly every red mana that you have is draw seven discard three that can get out of hand extremely quickly and probably win you the game by just being able to start doing breach stuff after that love seeing counterbalance in this list super cool yeah this list is so spicy it has a uh, kin basalt also has another way to make infinite mana there is dockside and is there any way to loop it infinitely there's no cloud stone there's no teamer saber tooth there's no baron which is kind of interesting i think i would always probably play a dockside outlet for me personally just because of how effective they are in the current format. Um, Displacer Kitten is here, obviously, to make Dockside still very broken. But yeah, I, th I think I would always probably play a Dockside infinite mana enabler because i watched so many games in the past two tournaments i've i've gone to just like infinite mana dockside loops just winning the game it just it keeps happening and it's just like 
it over and over and over again. It's either my deck or another deck that I've, I've seen play. Just like people just keep doing the Dockside thing and, and just like one or two permanents at a time. Then suddenly that player's got three or four. And then you look at your battlefield and you go, oops, I have a Dockside combo and it's a creature combo. So you can't really interact with that. But yeah, with the fact that like you're also playing Kinnon and stuff like that, I would definitely be curious as to why there is no infinite Dockside outlet in this list, especially because it seems like it would be very appropriate for the rest of what the deck is trying to do. But yeah, this deck is super cool. Oh, I love the synergy here of being able to play a Malevolent Hermit and then sacrifice it to your own Dargo and then cast it for its disturb cost. That's that's pretty cute if you don't want to like go have the counterspell side up. But a lot of this deck is super cool. Uh, Savala is so cool with Dargo. Suddenly you're you're adding X Men in any combination of colors where it's seven because of your Dargo on the battlefield. There's a bunch of different artifacts here. All of these allow you to basically get an early Dargo out. Uh, Jewel Lotus or Lion's Eye Diamond all like really help you get early Dargos. And this list is just so cool and it does like a lot of really unique stuff while also just like playing a lot of good things that also exist exist in the format, right? Like you are playing your Seedborn Muse Thrasios pile while also just like getting to play all these really spicy cards. And uh, Dargo is just like one of those commanders that like does everything and also not everything at the same time. Dargo is also really cute in um, stacked out board states because a lot of the time you're just like, all right, I'm going to put seven commander damage on you every turn. This clock adds up. What are you going to do about it? And it has trample too, right? So there's not much you can do. I'm surprised there's also no Fire Giant's Fury in this list, which is a super cool card with Dargo. Basically, if you target a giant, it allows you to like draw nine. I'm curious if uh, the pilot knew if that card existed. But yeah, this is a super cool list. Definitely super spicy. The fact that it got all the way to the finals is awesome. I love seeing unique lists like this take off the mox masters deck breakdown like the amount of lists that were available and like super unique stuff was really cool and really present the top 16 had a lot of really cool stuff there. There was a Satoru Umazawa in the top 16, which is super cool. And I just want to shout out this deck because it is majorly spicy. And yeah, feel free to come check that out. So I'm going to leave a link to the there's a tournament standings page on the uh, Eminence Gaming events for Mox Masters December 22. And what you can see here is that as you can go, you can click on what round we're talking about, right? So you can see this is where I got all the decks from the finals. And as you can see, there's a little Moxfield logo right here. And if you click on that over here, just let me finals, which are not the people I highlighted. Uh, but let's talk about say, oh, hey, I know Z Rob. Boom. What list were they playing? I get to see they're playing their uh, Rog Silas list. Boom. It's super cool. And I'm super happy that this is like an available option here on the website. It allows to just like really understand a bunch of the different unique options that we're seeing play in this tournament and the ones that did really well. Not only that, but you can see how many points these players got, right? So here's our top 16 that you can see right here. And you can see how many points each player earned in the Swiss. So you, for example, Forcon uh, was our one of our top four and one of our most winning players with four wins during the Swiss, right? Four wins, one loss, I believe that record. So uh, also for those curious trying to break down the math, uh, for every win is five points and then for every draw is one point. So for example, I qualified with two wins and uh, two draws. Then, uh, you know, there are other people here, three wins, three wins, one draw. You can do the math out basically. But it's it's pretty cool. There were five rounds in the Swiss, too, which will help you do that math. But you can see all of these semifinalist lists. You can see all the finals lists. You can see even going back to round one, every single deck that was played in this tournament. And it's I'm so happy that Eminence is doing this, that they are making this information publicly available. I can't even imagine like how awesome this is for people who are really into diving into like the research of these numbers. It's super cool stuff. Once again, so grateful to have uh, put up a another top four in this tournament. I am so happy to have been having such a good year as far as CEDH is concerned. A lot of hard work is paying off. And I just want to thank everyone who's helped me get to this point. Thank all the players who have taught me over the years to thank about the people who got me into this format. I want to thank all of the people who have supported this channel. Uh, if you want to be one of those supporters, please check out patreon.com slash comedian MTG. I can't stress enough how much the Patreon helps me just be able to continue to do this, continue to compete at the highest levels and just assist in giving you this content, the stuff that, you know, I, I hope this helps a ton. I really want to break down the format and teach new people. And that's all, everyone over Patreon helps out so very much. And if you can't afford that, and it's totally reasonable if you can't, please check out YouTube. And while you're here, do the free stuff, hit the subscribe button, hit the like on the video. Those things help out a ton too. And it helps YouTube know and help sponsors know that you guys enjoy this content.
Now let's talk about the next big thing in CEDH, and that is Silicon Dynasty. Now this January in San Jose, California, Eminence is doing it again. This is their next in-person tournament. Now, many of you were seeing my videos on Punt City and saw my breakdown of that tournament and seeing all the amazing things that came out of that tournament. Some people were saying it was the best run CEDH event to date. So many amazing things like that. I'm going to be doing an interview with Adam, Papaphobia from the Sad Nas podcast on this very channel talking about all the different things that are going to be available during this tournament and that should be coming out within the next week and I'm super excited to post that video for you all as well but check out Silicon Dynasty it is going to be the next premiere event for CEDH and probably the next one for a little bit uh, Eminence is is slowly taking over CEDH as far as like putting up these insane premiere events um, they helped run all these Mox Masters events they ran Punt City which once again was an insanely well run event and I'm so excited to continue working with that team it is all people that I have known for quite some time and all people who I know know how to run good events and Punt City was a clear demonstration of that and I'm so excited to be able to get over to the west coast and and do Silicon Dynasty again it looks like an amazing experience and I'm so excited to attend this event feel free to go check that out and I'll, I'll leave a link down below to the eminence page for this event it looks super cool and oh also, if you're worried about rooming and how expensive things can be, uh, they have these little things called room blocks, which is Eminence works with these hotels that they are doing these tournaments out of to make these things affordable. And as if you're someone who travels as much as I do for these CED events, CEDH events, uh, you know how much these things can cost. So uh, big shout out to Eminence for like trying to promote affordability in these tournaments. They are proxy friendly. They have room blocks like these. These things are meant to try and make these tournaments as accessible as possible. So go check that out. And I can't wait to bring you that interview with Adam coming up soon. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching today's video. Thank you so much for experiencing my currently mid-COVID <laughs> COVID tournament run. And some of you may be listening to this and being like, Ian sounds a little bit off, but I haven't heard him cough the whole time. That's because I edited those out. Seriously, though, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this stuff, hit like and subscribe. That's the free way to help out. And if you can, if you can throw any money at this channel, it helps out a ton. If you go over to patreon.com slash comedian MTG, where there's tons of perks, including your name in the show notes, like these amazing people who are showing up right here. I, I, I can feel the blood creeping up from the heathens. Got will, got fight, got pride, got reason. If they want to go eat, then you know I'm going to feed them. If you're coming for me, hope you're ready for a demon. I got eyes in the back of my head I'm seeing. Take me for granted and you know I'm leaving. I'm going to take what's mine with the webs I'm weaving. I could take this crap from seeing to believing. Uh,